This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Second, The Golden Thread. Chapter Six. Hundreds of People. The quiet lodgings of Dr. Manette were in a quiet street corner not far from Soho Square. On the afternoon of a certain fine Sunday, when the waves of four months had roiled over the trial for treason, and carried it, as to the public interest and memory, far out to sea, Mr. Jarvis Lorry walked along the sunny streets from Clerkenwell, where he lived, on his way to dine with the doctor. After several relapses into business absorption, Mr. Lorry had become the doctor's friend, and the quiet street corner was the sunny part of his life. On this certain fine Sunday, Mr. Lorry walked towards Soho, early in the afternoon, for three reasons of habit. Firstly, because on fine Sundays he often walked out before dinner with the doctor and Lucy. Secondly, because on unfavorable Sundays he was accustomed to be with them as the family friend, talking, reading, looking out of window, and generally getting through the day. Thirdly, because he happened to have his own little shrewd doubts to solve, and knew how the ways of the doctor's household pointed to that time as a likely time for solving them. A quainter corner than the corner where the doctor lived was not to be found in London. There was no way through it, and the front windows of the doctor's lodgings commanded a pleasant little vista of street that had a congenial air of retirement on it. There were few buildings then, north of the Oxford Road, and forest trees flourished and wild flowers grew, and the hawthorn blossomed in the now-vanished fields. As a consequence, country air circulated in Soho with vigorous freedom, instead of languishing into the parish like stray paupers without a settlement. And there was many a good south wall not far off, on which the peaches ripened in their season. The summer light struck into the corner brilliantly in the earlier part of the day, but, when the streets grew hot, the corner was in shadow, though not in shadow so remote that you could not see beyond it into a glare of brightness. It was a cool spot, staid but cheerful, a wonderful place for echoes and a very harbor from the raging streets. There ought to have been a tranquil bark in such an anchorage, and there was. The doctor occupied two floors of a large, stiff house, where several callings purported to be pursued by day, but whereof little was audible any day, and which was shunned by all of them at night. In a building at the back, attainable by a courtyard where a plane tree rustled its green leaves, church organs claimed to be made and silver to be chased, and likewise gold to be beaten by some mysterious giant who had a golden arm starting out of the wall of the front hall as if he had beaten himself precious, and menaced a similar conversion of all visitors. Very little of these trades, or of a lonely lodger rumored to live upstairs, or of a dim coach-trimming maker asserted to have a counting-house below, was ever heard or seen. Occasionally a stray workman putting his coat on traversed the hall, or a stranger peered about there, or a distant clink was heard across the courtyard, or a thump from the golden giant. These, however, were only the exceptions required to prove the rule that the sparrows in the plane tree behind the house, and the echoes in the corner before it, had their own way from Sunday morning unto Saturday night. Dr. Manette received such patience here as his old reputation, and its revival in the floating whispers of his story brought him. His scientific knowledge, and his vigilance and skill in conducting ingenious experiments, brought him otherwise into moderate request, and he earned as much as he wanted. These things were within Mr. Jarvis Lorry's knowledge, thoughts, and notice when he rang the doorbell of the tranquil house in the corner on the fine Sunday afternoon. Dr. Manette at home? Expected home. Miss Lucy at home? Expected home. Miss Pross at home? Possibly at home, but of a certainty impossible for a handmaid to anticipate intentions of Miss Pross as to admission or denial of the fact. As I am at home myself, said Mr. Lorry, I'll go upstairs. Although the doctor's daughter had known nothing of the country of her birth, she appeared to have innately derived from it that ability to make much of little means, which is one of its most useful and most agreeable characteristics. Simple as the furniture was, it was set off by so many little adornments, of no value but for their taste and fancy, that its effect was delightful. The disposition of everything in the rooms, from the largest object to the least, the arrangement of colors, the elegant variety and contrast attained by thrift in trifles, by delicate hands, clear eyes, and good sense, 
were at once so pleasant in themselves, and so expressive of their originator, that, as Mr. Lorry stood looking about him, the very chairs and tables seemed to ask him, with something of that peculiar expression which he knew so well by this time, whether he approved. There were three rooms on a floor, and the doors by which they communicated being put open that the air might pass freely through them all, Mr. Lorry, smilingly observant of that fanciful resemblance which he detected all around him, walked from one to another. The first was the best room, and in it were Lucy's birds, and flowers, and books, and desk, and works table, and box of watercolors. The second was the doctor's consulting room, used also as the dining room. The third, changingly speckled by the rustle of the plane tree in the yard, was the doctor's bedroom. And there, in a corner, stood the disused shoemaker's bench and tray of tools, much as it had stood on the fifth floor of the dismal house by the wine-shop in the suburb of saint antoine in paris I wonder, said Mr. Lorry, pausing in his looking about, that he keeps that reminder of his sufferings about him. And why wonder at that, was the abrupt inquiry that made him start. It proceeded from Miss Pross, the wild red woman, strong of hand, whose acquaintance he had first made at the Royal George Hotel in Dover, and had since improved. I should have thought, Mr. Lorry began. Pooh, you'd have thought, said Miss Pross, and Mr. Lorry left off. How do you do? inquired the lady then, sharply, and yet as if to express that she bore him no malice. I am pretty well, I thank you, answered Mr. Lorry, with meekness. How are you? Nothing to boast of, said Miss Pross. Indeed? Ah, indeed, said Miss Pross. I am very much put out about my ladybird. Indeed? For gracious sake, say something else besides indeed, or you'll fidget me to death, said Miss Pross, whose character, dissociated from stature, was shortness. Really, then, said Mr. Lorry, as an amendment, "'Really is bad enough,' returned Miss Pross, "'but better. "'Yes, I am very much put out. "'May I ask the cause? "'I don't want dozens of people "'who are not all worthy of Lady Bird "'to come here looking after her,' said Miss Pross. "'Do dozens come for that purpose?' Hundreds, said Miss Pross. "'It was characteristic of this lady, "'as of some other people before her time and sense, "'that whenever her original proposition was questioned, "'she exaggerated it.' "'Dear me,' said Mr. Lorry, as the safest remark he could think of. "'I have lived with the darling, or the darling has lived with me, and paid for it, "'which she certainly should never have done, you may take your affidavit, "'if I could have afforded to keep either myself or her for nothing, "'since she was ten years old. "'And it's really very hard,' said Miss Pross. "'Not seeing with precision what was very hard, Mr. Lorry shook his head, "'using that important part of himself as sort of a fairy cloak that could fit anything.' "'All sorts of people who are not in the least degree worthy of the pet "'are always turning up,' said Miss Pross. "'When you began it—' "'I began it, Miss Pross?' "'Didn't you? Who brought her father to life?' "'Oh, if that was beginning it,' said Mr. Lorry. "'It wasn't ending it, I suppose. "'I say, when you began it, it was hard enough, "'not that I have any fault to find with Dr. Manette, "'except that he is not worthy of such a daughter.' which is no imputation on him, for it was not to be expected that anybody should be, under any circumstances. But it is really doubly and trebly hard to have crowds and multitudes of people turning up after him, I could have forgiven him, to take Lady Bird's affections away from me. Mr. Lorry knew Miss Pross to be very jealous, but he also knew her by this time to be, beneath the service of her eccentricity, one of those unselfish creatures, found only among women who will, for pure love and admiration, bind themselves willing slaves to youth when they have lost it, to beauty that they never had, to accomplishments that they were never fortunate enough to gain, to bright hopes that never shone upon their own somber lives. He knew enough of the world to know that there is nothing in it better than the faithful service of the heart, so rendered and so free from any mercenary taint he had such an exalted respect for it that in the retributive arrangements made by his own mind, we all make such arrangements more or less, he stationed Miss Pross much nearer to the lower angels than many ladies immeasurably better got up both by nature and art, who had balances at Tellson's. There never was nor will be but one man worthy of Ladybird, said Miss Pross, and that was my brother Solomon, if he hadn't made a mistake in life. Here again, 
Mr. Lorry's inquiries into Miss Pross's personal history had established the fact that her brother Solomon was a heartless scoundrel who had stripped her of everything she possessed, as a stake to speculate with, and had abandoned her in her poverty for evermore, with no touch of compunction. Miss Pross's fidelity of belief in Solomon, deducting a mere trifle for this slight mistake, was quite a serious matter with Mr. Lorry, and had its weight in his good opinion of her. As we happen to be alone for the moment, and are both people of business, he said, when they had got back to the drawing-room and had sat down there in friendly relations, let me ask you, does the doctor, in talking with Lucy, never refer to the shoemaking time yet? Never. And yet he keeps that bench and those tools beside him? Ah, returned Miss Pross, shaking her head, but I don't say he don't refer to it within himself. Do you believe that he thinks of it much? I do, said Miss Pross. Do you imagine, Mr. Lorry had begun, when Miss Pross took him up short with, never imagine anything, have no imagination at all. I stand corrected. Do you suppose, you go so far as to suppose sometimes? Now and then, said Miss Pross. Do you suppose, Mr. Lorry went on, with a laughing twinkle in his bright eye as it looked kindly at her, that Dr. Manette has any theory of his own, preserved through all those years, relative to the cause of his being so oppressed, perhaps even to the name of his oppressor? I don't suppose anything about it but what Lady Bird tells me. And that is, that she thinks he has. Now, don't be angry at my asking all these questions, because I am a mere dull man of business, and you are a woman of business. Dull? Miss Pross inquired with placidity. Rather wishing his modest adjective away, Mr. Lorry replied, No, 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 surely not. To return to business, is it not remarkable that Dr. Manette, unquestionably innocent of any crime, as we all are well assured he is, should never touch upon that question? I will not say with me, though he has had business relations with me many years ago, and we are now intimate. I will say with the fair daughter to whom he is so devotedly attached, and who is so devotedly attached to him. Believe me, Miss Pross, I don't approach the subject with you out of curiosity, but out of zealous interest. Well, to the best of my understanding, and bad's the best, you'll tell me, Miss Pross, softened by the tone of apology, he is afraid of the whole subject. Afraid? It's plain enough, I should think, why he may be. It's a dreadful remembrance. Besides that, his loss of himself grew out of it. Not knowing how he lost himself or how he recovered himself, he may never feel certain of not losing himself again. That alone wouldn't make the subject pleasant, I should think. It was a profounder remark than Mr. Lorry had looked for. True, said he, and fearful to reflect upon. Yet a doubt lurks in my mind, Miss Pross, whether it is good for Dr. Manette to have that suppression always shut up within him. Indeed, it is this doubt, and the uneasiness it sometimes causes me, that has led me to our present confidence. Can't be helped, said Miss Pross, shaking her head. Touch that string, and he instantly changes for the worse. Better leave it alone. In short, must leave it alone, like or no. Sometimes he gets up in the dead of night, and will be heard, by us overhead there, walking up and down, walking up and down in his room. Ladybird has learnt to know then that his mind is walking up and down, walking up and down in his old prison. She hurries to him, and they go on together, walking up and down, walking up and down, until he is composed. But he never says a word of the true reason of his restlessness to her, and she finds it best not to hint at it to him. In silence they go walking up and down together, walking up and down together, till her love and company have brought him to himself. Notwithstanding Miss Pross's denial of her own imagination, there was a perception of the pain of being monotonously haunted by one sad idea in her repetition of the phrase, walking up and down, which testified to her possessing such a thing. The corner has been mentioned as a wonderful corner for echoes, and it had begun to echo so resoundingly to the tread of coming feet, that it seemed as though the very mention of that weary pacing to and fro had set it going. Here they are, said Miss Pross, rising to break up the conference, and now we shall have hundreds of people pretty soon. It was such a curious corner in its acoustical properties, such a peculiar ear of a place, that as Mr. Lorry stood at the open window, looking for the father and daughter whose steps he heard, he fancied they would never approach. 
Not only would the echoes die away, as though the steps had gone, but echoes of other steps that never came would also be heard in their stead, and would die away for good when they seemed close at hand. However, father and daughter did at last appear, and Miss Pross was ready at the street door to receive them. Miss Pross was a pleasant sight, albeit wild and red and grim, taking off her darling's bonnet when she came upstairs, and touching it up with the ends of her handkerchief, and blowing the dust off it, and folding her mantle ready for laying by, and smoothing her rich hair with as much pride as she could possibly have taken in her own hair if she had been the vainest and handsomest of women. Her darling was a pleasant sight, too, embracing her and thanking her, and protesting against her taking so much trouble for her which last she only dared to do playfully, or Miss Pross, sorely hurt, would have retired to her own chamber and cried. The doctor was a pleasant sight, too, looking on at them, and telling Miss Pross how she spoilt Lucy, in accents and with eyes that had as much spoiling in them as Miss Pross had, and would have had more if it were possible. Mr. Lorry was a pleasant sight, too, beaming at all of this in his wig, thanking his bachelor stars for having lighted him in his declining years to a home. But no hundreds of people came to see the sights, and Mr. Lorry looked in vain for the fulfillment of Miss Pross's prediction. Dinner time, and still no hundreds of people. In the arrangements of the little household, Miss Pross took charge of the lower regions, and always acquitted herself marvelously. Her dinners, a very modest quantity, were so well cooked, and so well served, and so neat in their contrivances, half English and half French, that nothing could be better. Miss Pross's friendship being of the thoroughly practical kind, she had ravaged Soho and the adjacent provinces in search of impoverished French, who, tempted by shillings and half-crowns, would impart culinary mysteries to her. From these decayed sons and daughters of Gaul, she had acquired such wonderful arts that the woman and girl who formed the staff of domestics regarded her as quite a sorceress, or Cinderella's godmother, who would send out for a fowl, a rabbit, a vegetable or two from the garden, and change them into anything she pleased. On Sundays, Miss Pross dined at the doctor's table, but on other days persisted in taking her meals at unknown periods, either in the lower regions or in her own room on the second floor, a blue chamber to which no one but her ladybird ever gained admittance. On this occasion, Miss Pross, responding to Ladybird's pleasant face and pleasant efforts to please her, unbent exceedingly, so the dinner was very pleasant, too. It was an oppressive day, and after dinner Lucy proposed that the wine should be carried out under the plane tree, and they should sit there in the air. As everything turned upon her and revolved about her, they went out under the plane tree, and she carried the wine down for the special benefit of Mr. Lorry. She had installed herself some time before as Mr. Lorry's cup-bearer, and while they sat under the plane tree talking, she kept his glass replenished. Mysterious backs and ends of houses peeped at them as they talked, and the plane tree whispered to them in its own way above their heads. Still, the hundreds of people did not present themselves. Mr. Darnay presented himself while they were sitting under the plane tree, but he was only one. Dr. Manette received him kindly, and so did Lucy. But Miss Pross suddenly became afflicted with a twitching in the head and body, and retired into the house. She was not unfrequently the victim of this disorder, and she called it, in familiar conversation, a fit of the jerks. The doctor was in his best condition, and looked specially young. The resemblance between him and Lucy was very strong at such times, and as they sat side by side, she leaning on his shoulder, and he resting his arm on the back of her chair, it was agreeable to trace the likeness. He had been talking all day on many subjects, and with unusual vivacity. "'Pray, Dr. Manette,' said Mr. Darnay, as they sat under the plane tree, and he said it in the natural pursuit of the topic in hand, which happened to be the old buildings of London, "'Have you seen much of the tower? Lucy and I have been there, but only casually. We have seen enough of it to know that it teems with interest, little more.' "'I have been there, as you remember,' said Darnay with a smile, though reddening a little angrily, in another character, and not in a character that gives facilities for seeing much of it. They told me a curious thing when I was there. What was that? Lucy asked. In making some alterations, the workmen came up on an old dungeon, which had been, for many years, built up and forgotten. Every stone of its inner wall was covered by inscriptions, which had been carved on by prisoners. Dates, names, complaints, and prayers. 
Upon a cornerstone in an angle of the wall, one prisoner, who seemed to have gone to execution, had cut as his last work three letters. They were done with some very poor instrument, and hurriedly, with an unsteady hand. At first they were read as D, I, C. But on being more carefully examined, the last letter was found to be a G. There was no record or legend of any prisoner with those initials, and many fruitless guesses were made what the names could have been. At length it was suggested that the letters were not initials, but the complete word DIG. The floor was examined very carefully under the inscription, and in the earth, beneath a stone or tile or some fragment of paving, were found the ashes of a paper mingled with the ashes of a small leathern case or bag. What the unknown prisoner had written will never be read, but he had written something, and hidden it away to keep it from the gaoler. "'My father!' exclaimed Lucy. "'You are ill!' He had suddenly started up with his hand to his head. His manner and his look quite terrified them all. "'No, my dear, not ill. There are large drops of rain falling, and they made me start. We had better go in.' He recovered himself almost instantly. Rain was really falling in large drops, and he showed the back of his hand with raindrops on it. But he said not a single word in reference to the discovery that had been told of, and, as they walked into the house, the business eye of Mr. Lorry either detected, or fancied it detected, on his face, as it turned towards Charles Darnay, the same singular look that had been upon it when it turned towards him in the passages of the courthouse. He recovered himself so quickly, however, that Mr. Lorry had doubts of his business eye. The arm of the golden giant in the hall was not more steady than he was when he stopped under it to remark to them that he was not yet proof against slight surprises, if he ever would be, and that the rain had startled him. Tea time, and Miss Pross went to make tea, with another fit of the jerks upon her, and yet no hundreds of people. Mr. Carton had lounged in, but he made only two. The night was so very sultry that although they sat with windows and doors open, they were overpowered by heat. When the tea-table was done with, they all moved to one of the windows and looked out into the heavy twilight. Lucy sat by her father, Darnay sat beside her, Carton leaned against a window. The curtains were long and white, and some of the thunder-gusts that whirled into the corner caught them up to the ceiling and waved them like spectral wings. "'The raindrops are still falling, large, heavy, and few,' said Dr. Manette. "'It comes slowly.' "'It comes surely,' said Carton. They spoke low, as people watching and waiting mostly do, as people in a dark room, watching and waiting for lightning, always do. There was a great hurry in the streets of people speeding away to get shelter before the storm broke. The wonderful corner for echoes resounded with the echoes of footsteps coming and going, yet not a footstep was there. "'A multitude of people, and yet a solitude,' said Darnay, when they had listened for a while." "'Is it not impressive, Mr. Darnay?' asked Lucy. "'Sometimes I have sat here of an evening, until I have fancied. "'But even the shade of a foolish fancy makes me shudder to-night, "'when all is so black and solemn. "'Let us shudder, too. We may know what it is. "'It will seem nothing to you. "'Such whims are only impressive as we originate them, I think. "'They are not to be communicated. "'I have sometimes sat alone here of an evening, listening.' until I have made the echoes out to be the echoes of all the footsteps coming by and by into our lives. "'There is a great crowd coming one day into our lives, if that be so,' Sidney Carton struck in, in his moody way. The footsteps were incessant, and the hurry of them became more and more rapid. The corner echoed and re-echoed with the tread of feet, some, as it seemed, under the windows, some, as it seemed, in the room." some coming, some going, some breaking off, some stopping altogether, all in the distant streets, and not one within sight. Are all these footsteps destined to come to all of us, Miss Manette? Are we to divide them among ourselves? I don't know, Mr. Darnay. I told you it was a foolish fancy, but you asked for it. When I have yielded myself to it, I have been alone, and then I have imagined them the footsteps of people who are to come into my life and my father. I take them into mine, said Carton. I ask no questions and make no stipulations. There's a great crowd bearing down upon us, Miss Manette, and I see them by the lightning. He added the last words, after there had been a vivid flash which had shown him lounging in the window. And I hear them, he added again, after a peal of thunder. 
Here they come, fast, fierce, and furious. It was the rush and roar of rain that he typified, and it stopped him, for no voice could be heard in it. A memorable storm of thunder and lightning broke with that sweep of water, and there was not a moment's interval in crash and fire and rain until after the moon rose at midnight. The great bell of St. Paul's was striking one in the cleared air when Mr. Lorry, escorted by Jerry, high-booted and wearing a lantern, set forth on his return passage to Clerkenwell. There were solitary patches of road on the way between Soho and Clerkenwell, and Mr. Lorry, mindful of footpads, always retained Jerry for this service, though it was usually performed a good two hours earlier. "'What a night it has been, almost a night, Jerry,' said Mr. Lorry, "'to bring the dead out of their graves.' "'I never see the night myself, Master, nor yet I don't expect to. What would do that?' answered Jerry." "'Good night, Mr. Carton,' said the man of business. "'Good night, Mr. Darnay. "'Shall we ever see such a night again together? "'Perhaps. "'Perhaps see the great crowd of people with its rush and roar "'bearing down upon them, too.'" End of Book Two, Chapter Six, Hundreds of People Read by Torah in Yellowstone National Park, October 2006